Will putting the equivalent of a human being on a plastic chip be the future of pharmaceutical testing? Stay tuned for a summary and discussion of this actual research study that furthered this technology. A lot of pharmaceutical testing and drug research is done in animals like mice. But there's a growing need for alternatives, not only because of ethical issues, but also because it's being increasingly recognized that animal responses don't always predict what will happen in humans. So we need more ways to test potential disease-treating drugs for efficacy and toxicity in human organs. Of course, we can't just test out lots of different medications and compounds in people. Cell culture of human cells is another way we could study how drugs might perform in the body. But growing cells in a single layer in a petri dish obviously lacks the complexity and variables present in the human body. Organoids are made up of 3D cultures of cells that resemble on a much smaller scale many aspects of human organs. Organoids can be created to mimic many organ systems like brain, heart, and lungs. Another alternative is organs on a chip, where either organoids or cells are cultured in the lab within small plastic devices that are separated into different compartments to more accurately mimic their environment in the body, like a liquid air interface or blood-brain barrier membrane. But in the body, all these systems are connected, not in separate tissue culture dishes. Hey, what if we connected all these cells or organoids somehow? Then we'd have, like, a human body on a chip. Believe it or not, this sci-fi sounding technology is an actual research tool used today. But real quick, Science Is You is a growing channel dedicated to making real scientific research papers available, accessible, and fun for everyone. To support this mission, please subscribe and spread the word. Thanks for watching. Prior to the publication of this study in 2020, there was research being done into linking types of lab-grown cell culture organ systems, known as human on a chip or human body on a chip, labeled with the futuristic sounding acronym HUBOC. But the types of systems being experimented with had some flaws. In order to culture cells of different types in the lab, say cardiac cells, neuronal cells, and lung cells, these cell types each have different requirements, such as different formulations of liquid they are growing in called growth media, or just media, and the percentage of gases like oxygen and carbon dioxide they are exposed to in the air surrounding them. In the body, these different organs are all compartmentalized and connected by a complex vasculature. So in the lab, it doesn't really work to just throw everybody in a petri dish and hope they get along. But it also isn't practical to try to connect tons of huge cell culture plates and petri dishes. That's where the field of microfluidics comes in. Microfluidics is a fancy term that basically means constructing tiny chambers to hold fluid. Think micro, small, and fluidics, fluid. As mentioned earlier, cells can be cultured on microfluidic chips, or organs on a chip. But why? Just growing cells or organoids in a dish isn't always enough. The environment around the cells also influences them and how they'll behave. For example, imagine being suddenly transported to a different environment, like a hot desert, or the Arctic, or having to live in a tiny, tiny room, or being surrounded by people you don't like. Cells react to all of these things too, both in terms of chemicals and other molecules around them, and also physical things like being compressed or stretched. All these things contribute to the cellular microenvironment. Think micro, small, and environment, or all the factors located around the cells that can influence them. To be able to more closely mimic the microenvironment that cells experience in the body, we need to be able to control it in the lab. For example, just squirting a drug we want to test onto, say, liver cells isn't what happens in the body, where the drug first travels through the bloodstream and then reaches the liver cells. Microfluidic devices can be constructed, for example, they contain two compartments, a chamber that holds our liver cells and another chamber that holds a blood substitute that carries nutrients. The two chambers are connected by a membrane that the liquid can pass through, and we can even line the membrane with endothelial cells, the cells that make up blood vessels in the body. Then we have a system where we can inject our drug into the chamber or channel with the blood substitute, let it perfuse through the membrane, and then see how it interacts with the liver cells. We can have organs on chips for many other systems too, of course, like heart, lungs, and neuronal cells. Each of these chips can be designed to more accurately mimic the conditions found in the body, like a liquid air interface for lung-associated cells, or a blood-brain barrier, or the ability to stretch and compress certain organs as might occur in the body. 
but still, in the body, a drug we want to test, for example, an anti-cancer drug candidate, might not necessarily be injectable, but taken orally. In this way, the drug would first pass through the gut, then be absorbed into the bloodstream, and then reach the target organ, for example. So we need some way to connect these organs on chips. But otherwise, what does such a system need to be able to support a human-on-a-chip experiment? We need to enable sample collection and changing out of blood substitute and growth media. The ability to take microscope images and study the cells and tissues in the different compartments, of course. And flexibility to link the organ chips differently to simulate different treatments, like an injectable drug versus an oral medication. In different conditions, like if an organ became damaged or stopped functioning. The researchers that wrote the study we're discussing today felt that prior attempts were lacking. Systems using different types of automated pumps to perfuse and link the microfluidic chambers made it difficult to observe and study the cells. Manual attempts at changing fluids between chambers also didn't quite cut it. For example, transferring fluids directly between the different compartments didn't quite simulate conditions in the bloodstream and required opening and closing the incubator the cells were growing in, causing frequent fluctuations in temperature and air quality. And complex experiments weren't really doable. So the researchers here present a new approach using liquid handling robotics. They designed an instrument they named the interrogator that is small enough to fit within a standard cell culture incubator. This interrogator instrument automatically circulates and replenishes the fluids between all the chips, avoiding opening and closing the incubator and disturbing the cells. It's also programmable in JavaScript by a computer interface located outside of the tissue culture hood, so that experimental conditions can be easily changed. A miniature mobile microscope enables taking images of the cells, and fluid samples can also be taken automatically. The instrument can support up to 10 organ chips, and the robotic fluid handling program can be customized, for example, to change where in the system a chemical is introduced. This could be useful, for example, if you wanted to test different drug delivery methods, such as orally, interacting first with gut cells, or subcutaneously, interacting first with skin or intravenous injected into the blood substitute. To further mimic the cellular microenvironment, some of the organ chips were designed to allow mechanical stretching or squeezing of the attached cells. This robotic system sounds great, but does it actually work as planned? To test it out, the researchers set up a trial with eight linked organ chips, intestine, liver, kidney, lung, heart, skin, blood-brain barrier, and brain. Each of the chips contained the organ cells in one compartment and vascular endothelial cells in the other compartment. They then programmed the instrument to mimic oral intake of a compound. This was done by transferring small volumes of the blood substitute from the outlet of an organ chip to the inlet of another, effectively making the liquid circulate through the chips in the order of first interacting with the gut chip, then liver chip, then kidney and heart chips, then lung, skin, and brain chips. They were able to perfuse the blood substitute through all these chips and maintain cellular growth for three weeks. They also infused a dye to more closely trace the circulation of the blood substitute through the system, mimicking, for example, a small drug or compound being absorbed into the intestines and entering the bloodstream. They then measured the concentrations of tracer dye in the different organ chips and found they were highly reproducible. They could even create detailed simulations in silico, or on the computer, that matched their experimental trial. This confirmed that the interrogator was circulating the blood substitute consistently and reliably. This is essential for experimental success. But in addition to monitoring drug delivery, what experiments can we do? There's a lot of potential research that can be done with this. For example, organ chips can be made to mimic diseases like COPD, asthma, infections, effects of toxic exposures, or radiation could be studied. And different drugs tested for efficacy or off-target effects or unwanted effects on other organs or cells. The researchers here mentioned that they published a companion paper where they were able to successfully obtain data on two drugs that matched data obtained from clinical trials. What do you think? Will human body on a chip systems ever be able to completely replace research done on animals or even clinical trials? Are there special ethical concerns we should consider with these types of experiments? Share in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe to help us out. And remember, 